Radio. You're listening to PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome to Save a Pooch on Pet Life Radio. I am Beverly Isla, your host. Thank you for tuning in. This show, we will focus on the use of medical cannabis that can benefit pets. In fact, medical marijuana is making headway in North America's medical system. And depending on where you stand on it, it's a good thing or not a good thing. But we're not going to get into how it can help people in this show. Today's guests are veterinarian doctors Sarah Brandon and Dr. Greg Copes, who have done research on cannabis science for over 16 years and have formulated the product line called Canna Companion. So when we get back from these messages, we will have doctors Sarah Brandon and Dr. Greg Copes talk to us about their work and how it can help issues related to not only rescue dogs, but pets in general. Sit. Stay. We'll be right back after a short pause. Well, four to be exact. At Red Barn, our pet food ingredients work overtime. They aren't just there for show. Dandelion greens work to maintain a healthy digestive system. Salmon oil works to enhance the immune system. Green-lipped mussels work to support joint health. These hard-working ingredients support your dog's active, healthy life. Look at the label. We want you to. Red Barn Naturals Pet Food. Simply the best. Find it in your local pet specialty store. Try our grain-free stews. The only pet food with Red Barn Bully Sticks. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to Save a Pooch. We are talking with Dr. Sarah Brandon and Dr. Greg Copes on their work on medical cannabis for pets. Thank you for coming on today, guys. Hi, Beverly. Thank Thanks for having us. Now, you guys are considered the pioneers in this space. How did you guys get into it well over a decade ago before we even thought it would be possible to be used for certain issues? Well, I will actually uh, send my husband out on that one. He has uh, some pretty significant joint discomfort oh. and started looking into medical marijuana for himself. And once we found out how well it worked for him, we moved on to one of our dogs who had severe hip disease. And uh, we found that he responded beautifully. And over the last more than a decade, we slowly administered it to more and more animals and adjusted uh, the dosing ranges, starting with our animals first and then extending into our friends' pets and then family members and eventually patients. And uh, once we were comfortable with the safety margins and uh, how well it was working, we went ahead and made it available to the public. Oh, wow. And you guys were, have, like, you guys were doing this 16 years ago. Was that even... Uh, <laughs> I can just imagine the ceiling that you guys must have been heating in regulation. <laughs> Well, yeah, it was all, it was all uh, uh, certainly on the down low, so to speak. <laughs> we, uh, yes, you're right. It, it was, it was a little hairy there for a while, but we yeah. thought, you no, know, this really is what our license says we need to do. We found something that we thought was going to help our patients, and we figured we might as well pursue it and see what could happen. And then once we started really getting into the regulations, oh, probably the last five years or so we started understanding that hemp met our patient's needs and it was actually legal. So that's, yeah. that's kind of how we got going into that. That's awesome. So, Greg, how's your uh, joint pain? <laughs> it's uh, it's significant, significant, significantly improved. I um, She touched on it briefly. I, I can't take any NSAIDs or opioids or anything for any extended mm-hmm. period of time. I have some significant allergies and, and reactions to those things, so I had to find something else to help and alleviate the pain. And and I was an emergency veterinarian for 15 years, 14 years, and I dealt with a, more marijuana toxicities in pets than I can remember. And oh, wow. I was never concerned about the actual marijuana ingestion if it was just marijuana. You know, it's basically huh. a supportive, it's, a, it's a basically a supportive care thing. You know, you give them yeah. fluids and time and in a quiet room, you know, so they're not responding to any kind of visual or auditory stimulus that is being filtered or being changed by by that ingestion. I was always worried about medibles, you know, something that somebody cooked 
you know, they made brownies or something and the dog got oh, into brownies. Oh, okay. You know, okay. That's, that's what I was concerned about. I was concerned about the chocolate or raisins or, you know, peanuts or xylitol or something else. And then I started noticing that these animals, once they got through the initial dysphoric period, you know, where everything was, they just don't understand. They don't understand mm. being high. But once they got through <laughs> that period and they relaxed, they were actually fairly pain-free. You know, they felt mm. good. They were just high, you know, and they don't, under animals didn't understand that. So I right, took right. that experience and then what I was doing for my own pain and discomfort and like, like Sarah said, started giving it to one of our, our dogs, Riley. And, you know, I thought, well, I'm an emergency veterinarian. If something goes wrong, I mean, I know That's what true. to, I know what to look for. I know what to do. And surprisingly, it went the other way. He responded and that's where we started refining our formula for, for pets. That is awesome. But before we get into uh, some of the benefits, I have to ask, what would you say to those that are not open to the concept of using cannabis for their pet's health? Uh, I think that they need to, I think they need to get online. <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, there is just a plethora of research out there in in other countries, uh, Israel, let's just take Israel, they are, they're, they're probably a decade or two ahead of us. With and it, where is this? Israel? Israel, yep. Oh. Yep, they, have, okay. they have some of the best medical uh, cannabis research that is available. And they've done it on, uh, they've done some of the research, obviously, in the laboratory, but then rodents and dogs and cats, and, and not a lot of them, but enough mm-hmm. to show that uh, dogs and cats and horses and, and every mammal that's been tested so far they have the receptors necessary in order to respond to cannabis. In fact, they have natural, what's called cannabinoids, so the, the active components of cannabis. They have that in, our, in their system, just like we do. Uh, we essentially grew up evolutionary alongside this plant, and our bodies have adapted this receptor system. So that mm-hmm. being said, if you can take even 10 I'd say 10 studies that indicate how this plant can help an animal, I think that you will at least start to be open to the idea. And then if you dig into it a little bit further, you can compare it to supplements that we have now that we use regularly. And most people will find that what we're using now in, let's say, let's take glucosamine. It's a great supplement. Oh, yeah, I love that. Yeah, yeah, it's a great supplement. It works really well. But there are there are more studies on cannabis and medical cannabis than there are on glucosamine, if if you were to compare them all. So Hmm. how can one say, I'm going to use this really safe product called glucosamine and nothing's perfect but it it is they're going to use that but they won't even consider using a medical cannabis product yeah exactly I, yeah so get online do some research call us we'll talk to you we'll we'll have it we'll, yeah. we won't say you have to use our product but we will yeah, point yeah. Absolutely in the right not. direction yeah yeah and it's a plant plant yes <laughs> Yes. yes, I mean, think about, we have other, we use other plants to, to develop other drugs. Digitalis is from a plant. Well, uh, that's a heart well, medication, so it's, go ahead. Yeah, and, and what I like to tell people, you know, there, there are researchers that spend their entire professional careers, you know, trying to isolate an enzyme or isolate a, a gene complex that they think may be the, the foundation for a new analgesic or a new anti-cancer drug or something uh-huh. like that. And in this plant, there are over 480 known compounds of which we know about a third of what, what's in there and what they do. And I, as a scientist, I just don't understand why we can't look at this plant. You know, we can go and, you know, we can go and extract sea snake venom, you know, from some snake in the South Pacific and they've done that and then tried to isolate an enzyme that they thought was going to be the foundation for a new what's called a neuropathic for neuropathic pain you have to ignore this plant and what its potential is yeah I'm I, I have just to agree with the you there I yeah saw, yeah I saw the benefit and I saw the potential and, and like Sarah alluded to early on you know our license states that we have to do and continue our scientific education and research for the betterment of the human animal bond and I thought this fit the bill Going on that route specifically, how do you think it could benefit the issues commonly portrayed by rescue dogs? I mean, I mean, there's a lot, but I mean, some of the top things that you, that come to mind for you. I would say probably the number one thing that we get, especially from rescue dogs, you know, we get consultations for, is going to be anxiety and behavior concerns relating to that. And it's 
it's going to do pretty much the same thing that it does in humans. We're just looking at mm-hmm. a smaller, smaller amount. So let's take a, a dog that has been, well, actually, I'll use one of ours as an example. One of our Belgian Malinois by the name of Gnarls, we're his fourth home. And when we adopted him, he was about two and a half years old. Oh, um, good for is, you guys. Uh, well, we, we try to uh, uh, practice what we preach, so to speak. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's good. <laughs> So having that many homes in such a short amount of time is critical for how he sees the world. He had so many different homes and no stable pack, if you will, Mm -hmm. um, that he had, I wouldn't say he had really PTSD, but he had a lot of anxieties. And what we found compared to other dogs that we've rescued in similar situations, when we tried to train him, you know, your basic sit, stay, and and then obviously more fun things like find it, which is our, our go find his ball command. He was able to focus and concentrate much better on what we were trying to teach him during his training sessions than other dogs, provided he had cannabis. And it was amazing to see his anxiety levels drop. He just, he was able to focus on us better and retain the information that we were telling him. In short, cannabis helped him not be so worried about anxiety and to focus and kind of rewire his brain to realize that it's going to be okay. Right, this forever right. home, this is how it's going to be. Other shelter dogs, I mean, and this, I'll back up a little bit, that extends to, you know, thunder phobias and all kinds of anxieties that, that we see in shelters. So that's probably the number one thing I would say that we see. Okay. Well, so the, me, the, uh, the, sorry, go ahead, Greg. Well, the nuts and bolts of that are the same in humans as well, that they're looking at these compounds for post-traumatic stress disorder. You know, the memories are, memories are stored in the hippocampus and the amygdala. And yeah. without going into the nuts and bolts of that, basically recalling a memory is a creative process. The hippocampus stores the nuts and bolts of our memory, the, the hows, the whens, the times, the, the things of that nature. The amygdala stores the emotions associated with those memories. And what these compounds have shown to do is not erase those memories, but enable the the user to kind of rewrite those memories and not have such such strong negative emotions associated with those memories anymore. And you get the mm, same effect okay. in animals. So if you have animals that come from a severely abused situation, or, or like Sarah was saying with Gnarls, one of our dogs, yeah. you know, he just never had a stable pack where he could, you know, relax and, and know what his position was in the pack and be comfortable with it. So there was always that anxiety, you know, what do I do? How do I do? I just don't know. And like she said, when we started administering this to him, it allowed him to kind of let some of that go and focus on what we wanted him to do and then eventually become more comfortable. Would you (laughs) allocate like your dog success more so because of the medical cannabis or to the environment? Both. Both. Yeah. Okay. It's both. It's both. it's a combination, you know, it's, it's using cannabis to basically to facilitate training or counter conditioning and desensitization that allows those animals to move past those points where they, that trigger those events, whether it be right. separation anxiety or whatever, it helps them leave some of that behind, for lack of a better word, and focus on the here and now and what we're going to do and not make those associations because gotcha. that's how animals learn association. You know, A plus, they don't learn A plus B equals C. They learn that if these things happen, this happens, you know, or if these right, things happen, yeah. this happens. So it helps them break some of those associations or rewire some of those associations. Oh, that would be really helpful. Yes. Yeah, it is. And, and while our Gnarls is our example, we, since we started Canon Companion, we actually stayed in touch with as many clients as we possibly could. So we're luckily that is in the thousands. Pet parents are are just wonderful about providing feedback on where their yeah, their animal is and how it's worked uh, or how it hasn't worked and where does the dosing change uh, need to be instituted. But I mention that because they have been fantastic about saying, you know, this dose really helps my dog focus and mm-hmm. he can go out and let's let's take uh, some of our agility dogs. I know these aren't these aren't rescues, but they still can have some pretty significant anxieties. Hold that thought. We're just going to have a quick break. And then when we get back, we'll continue talking about this uh, new movement. Sit. Stay. We'll be right back after a short pause. Well, four to be exact. You love your dog. (laughs) And getting kisses from them. 
but their breath can be downright stanky. <laughs> Knock out their smelly breath with Stank Be Gone. Stank Be Gone is made with natural ingredients to eliminate their bad breath while helping to reduce plaque and tartar. Just add a capful to your dog's drinking water. Stank Be Gone is only $19.95. Use promo code STANK to receive a second bottle for just $5. Go to stankbegone.com today. That's stankbegone.com. My Golden Retriever Sundance is a lot more playful now. She has more pep and energy than I've seen in years. Tons of energy. Petey is having fun again. He's got a shiny coat and a good healthy weight. Molly's been having four scoops a day. She pushes her little bowl all the way across the room, emptying every last single crumb. She has slimmed down and gotten this puppy look. She's got life. She's got energy. She's got stuff to give. We get asked all the time when we're at shows, how do you get your dog so healthy and shiny and glossy? D-I-N-O-V-I-T-E dot com. 859-428-1000. The omega-3 fatty acids. Flaxseed, zinc, alfalfa. The digestive enzymes that are cooked out of regular dog food. Family will be on Dynavite for the rest of his life. Just feed your dog right. Use Dynavite. If it's working, don't quit. 859-428-1000. 859-428-1000. I-N-O-V-I-T-E dot com. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio dot com. <laughs> Welcome back to Save a Pooch. We are talking with leaders in the medical cannabis for pets arena, doctors Sarah Brandon and Dr. Greg Copes. Okay, let's pick up where you where we left off, Sarah. Sorry, continue. <laughs> no, that's just that's quite fine. So we were uh, we were speaking about uh, anxieties, and I kind of branched off a little bit from from our shelter mm-hmm. and rescue patients into agility dogs, and it doesn't particularly matter what triggered an event, but, but let's say this agility dog now has significant anxiety uh, every time it goes to an event. Okay. And the sad part is many of the agility dogs love to do agility. That's, that's their bread and butter. They think it's great, but now they can't enjoy that anymore. And what we found from pet parents providing feedback is uh-huh. they were able to give cannabis and say, let's retrain, let's go to these events, but now the uh, their dog's brain is able to go, okay, <laughs> I don't, I don't have to be quite so worried. And wait, what? We get to go. We get to go play. We get to. We get to do this agility. Oh, that's great! And they get excited again. So yeah. it's. Uh, it really is just kind of a, a reset button and helps them relax a little and and enjoy their surroundings again. That's fascinating. I'm just really curious. So this this medical cannabis is not so much. It won't hype up the dogs. No. No, we haven't seen any of that. Really, what it uh, what it does is just allows them to to focus and to, as Greg said, be here in the now and be able to enjoy that time again. Oh, okay, okay. Huh. There are no with our product. I mean, I can't speak to other products out there, but with our product, the THC is below obviously the federally mandated level of of zero point three percent, but it's also below what's called the psychotropic threshold which means that it's far below the the amount needed to cause any of those dysphoric or high effects that that people get from from THC. So it's just because there is a a THC in our product doesn't mean that there is an amount that will cause those dysphoric feelings. It's far below that threshold. But THC brings some very important positive aspects to what we're doing and what we're seeing. So that's why our product Hmm. is, is a whole plant product. We don't strip out, and I'll just to give you an example, we don't strip out and just, you know, give CBD or CBN or whatever it is. Our product is the entire plant because from the research that I did early on and continue to do to this day, I just feel that the whole plant works better synergistically and with the entourage effect than a single component does, a single component compound does for for our research and what we've seen. I like that. I like that perspective, actually. Do you find a difference between uh, treating pets and people? I guess you don't really treat people with it, but (laughs) do you think there'd be a difference? Yeah, well, we like to tell people because it's, you know, it's hard for people to kind of get their head around. It's like, well, wait Mm -hmm. a minute. I thought this was toxic to animals. And it is. I mean, anything it has a well most things have a therapeutic range and a toxic range you know right. it's finding yeah. that range that where you can get therapeutic benefit but not have the negative side effects or the get into that toxic effect 
But yeah. what we tell people is any of the effects that humans can derive from medical cannabis, or you know, whether it be palliative care for chemotherapy or cancer or anti-inflammatory effects or whatever, you can see in animals. It's just finding the right dose range and ratios that work in that particular species. Okay, the ratio. But with people yeah. that are becoming open to this, and I know quite a few people, how would they tell if a company is legit? In their products or not? Ooh, I got this. What are, yeah, what are, the, what <laughs> yeah, are exactly. they looking for? <laughs> exactly. The, I'll, the I'll number, yeah, yeah, the number one thing that you need to do, uh, and this applies to humans looking for themselves or for family members or, or for their pets, get a COA, a certificate of analysis. What is it called? Um, it's called a certificate of analysis, a certificate. abbreviated, yep, COA. COA. COA, okay. Yes. Yeah. What these are, these are third-party analyses of a given product, and it helps provide some, some legitimacy to a company's claims. Uh, some companies post them online, others just provide them upon request, but if a company doesn't do that, then I would go elsewhere. This isn't proprietary information. Uh, uh-huh. This is all information that somebody can purchase your product, and they can test it and find it out anyway. So might as well say, hey, here's what I say my product has. Here's what I say it can do. And while you can't prove everything that it can do until obviously somebody takes it, you can at least say, all right, this company says there are, uh, I'm just going to make this up, uh, five milligrams of CBD and two milligrams of THC in a given dose. If you were to look at a COA, then that COA is going to prove that. Yes, this product Mm, has CBD, this product has THC. I would also recommend that to make sure that if you really, really want to get into the nitty gritty of it, double check where that lab is. Did they do it by what's called HPLC? That's a testing method. What she's talking about is high-performance liquid chromatography, and that is the gold standard for testing these compounds or the amount of compounds in any given end product, whether it be an oil or a powdered product or whatever. And okay. what I wanted to add to what Sarah was saying is on the spectrum of where we are in this country for yes. cannabis, we have maybe stepped a toe outside of the traveling medicine show. You know, where the snake oil salesman comes and sells you a bottle of whatever and it cures everything. We have just now started to kind of emerge in this country from that stigma of what this plant is and what it can do. You know, we've dealt with clients who have purchased a product and they didn't have the ability to test the product in their area and we tested it for them. And some of these products have nothing in them. They're just olive oil or canola oil or whatever. And these people are bottling this stuff up. And because there's such an interest now in this country or moving towards that, you know, these people are looking for something and it may be a last ditch something for their pet. They're reaching out to some company and they buy, you know, a a five mil bottle of olive oil, you know, that has nothing else in it. So these COAs, Not only do they protect the consumer as far as this is what's in this product, it doesn't have any solvents or residual materials in it that could harm, you know, a small pet, a 20-pound animal. And also, as a medical professional, if I want to recommend something to somebody, I have to know what's in that. You know, I can't just, I use the analogy of walking into our pharmacy in a clinic and picking a bottle off the shelf that has no label in it. And when you open it up, it's got a mixture of capsules and tablets and everything else in it. And you pour out 14 and give them to somebody and go, okay, give two of those a day and let me see how it works. That's what we're getting into with this because people Mm -hmm. now have the option to go into dispensaries and other places to purchase something. And if you don't know what's in that, you're giving something blind to your pet that you hope works out. And that's usually not a good combination. No. So this COA, does it apply to North America or is it just the States? It's a, okay. It's everywhere. It's, yeah. a, it's a testing modality. It breaks down what's in the product, and you can have microbial testing because we've also dealt with some products that have some fairly significant bacterial overgrowth. And, you know, for animals that may be immune compromised or have uh-huh. other issues, you know, if you give a product that's loaded down with some sort of, you know, salmonella or E. coli or some sort of resistant bacteria that's grown in this product, you're going to create significant problems, you know. And then the other, mm. the last thing that they can test for are solvents or residual residual compounds that are used either in the processing or are 
found on the plant when it was grown. They use some sort of insecticide or pesticide or something like that. So a COA can test what's in the product as far as concentrations are, the amount of these compounds. It can test for microbes. You know, is anything nasty growing in here that I shouldn't be giving to my, my animal or my ant for that reason? You know, and then the last thing is solvent, residual solvents and, and chemicals that in a man my size, if I go into a dispensary and I pick something off the shelf and it's got some residual butane in it or something like that, it's probably not going to be a problem for me. That level mm-hmm. of hydrocarbon left in that product is not going to be an issue for somebody my size. But right. when you start to give that to an animal that's 10 pounds or uh, 20 yeah. pounds, mm-hmm. then you get something that is increasingly concentrated and all of those hydrocarbon residues, whether they be pesticides or butane or naphthalene, those are all endocrine disruptors. They stimulate, in a bad way, the immune system, and they directly affect heart muscle. So if you have an animal that's sick and you're looking to give them something, you want to make sure that that is yeah. as clean as possible. Yes, yeah, duly noted. So before we wrap up, what do you guys hope Canna Companion gets into uh, the next few years? Ooh, I am very excited about getting us into the equine field. Horses, horses. Oh, horses. I am very okay. excited to get into yeah. horses. Yep. We've done some early preliminary studies, and yes, horses do respond well to cannabis, but we need a little bit more testing uh, in horses, uh-huh. especially those that show. They have they have elimination trials that we need to run. Uh, they get tested for, for various products, product enhancing drugs and such. And while I don't necessarily think that cannabis is a product or excuse me, a performance enhancing compound, I do think that it, you know, it, it relieves pain and helps horses feel better. But uh, nonetheless, it's something that could be tested for. So we gotta we gotta check these what's called a withdrawal time and, and make sure that if you oh. administer the product, when can you show your horse and such. But it does help. It relieves, you know, pain and inflammation. Mm-hmm. We used to actually this this I'm a little bit of a geek and I find this fascinating that about a hundred years ago uh, you could purchase uh, hemp or marijuana-based tinctures that controlled colic. And, and colic in horses is kind of similar to colic in babies, but, you know, they don't feel good. Their, their stomach hurts, they're upset, uh, they might be a little gassy, and, and things just don't feel well. And oh. uh, cannabis can kind of help come, come around and help take care of some of that. And we did use it as a veterinary profession. We used it for generations so yeah. it was made illegal in this country so gosh uh, i'm very excited to have something like that back in the arena and and start helping our our larger patients that would be awesome the potential is so high for you guys that is awesome so thank you guys so much for talking to us about your work and our show producer mark winter for making this show possible so if you have any questions comments or ideas for a show please email me at beverly at petliferadio.com So I do encourage you to take a look at their site, which is full of education and valuable information. So it's CannaCompanionUSA.com, right? That's right. That's perfect. (laughs) So until next time, spread animal compassion. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.